the fall of 99, I wrote the White House Thanksgiving proclamation, which is the reason that we celebrate Thanksgiving today is because the president issues this proclamation. It's kind of a formality now, but um, it goes all the way back to George Washington, Lincoln, everyone issued it, and they wrote it themselves. I mean, literally like, sat down and wrote it themselves You know, with a quill, quill pen in the White House. Um, they didn't have big staffs back in those days. And so 99, I wrote it, like literally sat down and wrote it myself. You talk about the pressure that you have, you know, no, knowing that you're writing down this thing that's studied by historians. And so I wrote it. I was really proud of it. They printed up on this big parchment paper, uh, kind of formal and everything. And I, I put a copy in the mail and I sent it to Sorkin. Uh, I said, just FYI, here you go. I thought you might want to check this out. And I didn't think much of it. A year later, uh, November of 2000, I go and I, I put on the West Wing and I watch the Thanksgiving episode. And the episode is about the writing of the Thanksgiving proclamation. And this, this repeating theme throughout the entire episode is about like how the speechers are running around, you know, talking about how they need to write the Thanksgiving proclamation. And the climactic scene, very end, Mar- uh, Martin Sheen, you know, playing President Bartlett, is about to walk out of the Oval Office and go into the Rose Garden to read this Thanksgiving proclamation. And he looks down, it's like, you know, the climax and everything. He looks down and he, sit, and he just reads the first line of the paper in front of him. And the line that he reads is the exact same first <laughs> line of the proclamation that I wrote. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. John, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Oh my God, so excited to be here, Srini. Thank you for having me. Well, it is really cool to have you here. You know, I have come across your story by way of our mutual friend, Matthew Monroe, who has numerous times emailed me and said, you really got to talk to John. He has some amazing stories. So uh, on that note, can you tell us uh, a bit about yourself, your story, uh, your journey, your background, and how that has led you to everything that you're up to now? Oh my God, that's just like, (laughs) I feel (laughs) such pressure now to really deliver but uh, I, I will try. I've been a big fan of yours, Trini, for a long time, so it's really an, an honor to be here. Um, well, the thing I guess I'm most known for now, um, I run a site called Smart Business Revolution, uh, a blog and a podcast, and I teach people how to build better relationships in business and turn those relationships into revenue. But my backstory is I came from a family that didn't have really any special connections or anything like that, humble middle-class family. Father was a journalist. Mother was a travel agent. And uh, my father actually lost his job three separate times when I was growing up. Every time he lost his job, we had to move thousands of miles away from family and friends. So I really knew what struggle was like. And it inspired me to study what successful people do. And it taught me really the importance of relationships. Your relationships are really the most critical thing that you have in the world of business. And it led to a lot of opportunities for me. And, and so um, even though I didn't go to any Ivy League school, even though I haven't, didn't have any advanced graduate degree at the time, um, I was an early employee of DreamWorks at 20 years old. I, was, I really got my, dr- my, my dream job at 23 years old as a writer in the Clinton White House. And I've worked in the heart of Silicon Valley. And I've um, also uh, run my own uh, boutique law firm in the San Francisco Bay Area for the last couple of years and been building my reputation online. And all of those things universally really the, the common thread was building relationships with the right people and spending a lot of e- energy and effort on doing that. And so that's what I show other people how to do now today. All right. So we will get uh, deep into that. But you know, I, I want to ask you a little bit about <clears throat> the early part of your childhood and growing up. I mean, you mentioned that your dad lost his job three times and that you guys moved a lot. And you said that it inspired you to study what successful people did. And I'm wondering why you think certain people are inspired by experiences like that and others are not. Oh, good question. Um, well, there's two different ways you can react to something like that. You can wallow in self-pity and, and feel sorry for yourself, or you can say, okay, here's a problem. How do I delve into it and figure out a solution to it? How do, you fig- how do I figure out what other people, how other people have coped uh, in order to avoid this type of problem from manifesting itself in the first place? And how other people deal with it. And that's the tack that I took. You know, I, I was an avid reader and I started devouring biographies and autobiographies and studying, you know, successful people across all kinds of different disciplines. You know, I studied successful entrepreneurs and politicians and athletes and actors and directors and 
and um, you know saw what they did and then applied it to my life as I became a teenager and as I got older. Hmm. When you look back uh, at those early years of your life, especially dad being a journalist and all that, are there experiences uh, or moments or, or people that you think ultimately shaped uh, the journey to you ending up as a White House staff writer? And if so, what were they? Well, I definitely think the moving frequently as a kid was critical. You know, I, I always thought it was kind of funny when I got to college, I went away to college, and there were people who were homesick, you know, you know <laughs> or, or that had trouble adjusting with other, you know, new people because it was their first time away from home. And, you know, when you move in the middle of a school year, as I did, or you move right before high school, in your first day of high school, you know hardly anyone, then going away to college is not that big a deal. You know, I mean, I had those experiences growing up. I, I didn't grow up in the same small town the entire time and know everyone. And uh, I, I had the experience of moving into a new school where I knew nobody. And um, <laughs> oftentimes I was moving across country. So it was culture shock. You know, I'd, I moved from Massachusetts, suburban Massachusetts, to Southern California, which, Shrini, you know what, Southern, you know, those two don't have a lot in common. You know? I, mean, <laughs> I showed up wearing like a knit sweater, you know, and like khaki pants, you know, to high school and everyone else is wearing like board shorts and flip flops. And, you know, and that was when I went to move to Southern California. So, uh, you know, I think what it taught me is it taught me how to how to cope and adapt and to deal with new communities and to figure out that you can infiltrate a new community. You can make new friends. You can meet new people. Um, and, and it's okay. And actually, it, it can be a great thing. And it's actually one of the things that, even though it was painful during my childhood, having to move away from friends and having to make new friends and, and uh, get used to a new community, I think now it's made me who I am today. And I, I enjoy meeting new people and I enjoy new communities. And I think that's why in my career, I've been really comfortable with moving from politics to Hollywood, to Silicon Valley, to law, to building my reputation as an expert and a, and a thought leader. And each of those new communities, you have to meet all new people. And your network from before often doesn't do any good for the new industry that you're working in. And so in spite of that, you know, I think because of my childhood, I'm, I'm comfortable with that process. So when you talk about moving frequently, and I only know this because I had a very similar experience growing up, you know, I think probably by the time I started my sophomore year in high school, I'd been to something like 13 different schools. Wow. Uh, what did you learn about relationships and coping and adapting from the experiences of moving so much that you applied later on in your life? And what can other people take away from that? Right. Well, I think um, uh, a big piece of it is that um, to try and understand where people are coming from. Um, you know, a lot of times we make snap judgments on on uh, surface. You know, because that's all the information we have, at least initially. And oftentimes, I'd come to a new community, a new school. And the people who I was friends with at the end of the year was completely different from the people that I was friends with at the beginning of the year. And at the beginning of the year, when you first get there, you make some snap judgments about people. And I think that what is really incumbent upon all of us is to, is to let those decisions not guide your actions. Because, you know, you could make a snap judgment about someone and then just avoid someone entirely and not give them the time of day. Um, when it turns out that if you got to know them on a deeper level, that you actually would get along really well. Um, and I, I found that f that happened really frequently. You know, oftentimes, even sometimes you have a similar personality. So the two of you maybe kind of rub each other the wrong way initially, or you don't get along, and then you get to know each other, and then you, you become fast friends or whatever. Um, so I, I think that was one of the big lessons. And I, I think that's a big lesson for everyone else. Hmm. Well, let's do this. Let's talk uh, about the time in the White House uh, as a, a Clinton staff writer, because I, like, I can't imagine what kinds of misperceptions we have. From what I am told from Matt, the Rob Lowe character in the West Wing was actually based on you. Well, I, I, I guess I say partially inspired. <laughs> partially so, inspired. Well, I'd like to hear uh, about the experience in a lot more detail. I mean, what did you learn about human behavior? What did you learn about psychology? Uh, what did you learn about success from being so close to somebody like a president? Uh, and of course, you know, what did you learn about relationships and navigating uh, such a complex environment socially? Wow. Well, it was really challenging in, in a good way. You know, incredibly intelligent people working there, um, all well-intentioned, um, 
And I love that. Uh, one of the part of the reason I went to ended up going to law school is because I was surrounded by people who had been to law school or who had been lawyers. Um, and so, I, and I, I love that. And they were usually the ones that beat me in in arguments. You know, we'd have a discussion or something, and they would win. And I was like, "Darn, you know, I need to go study some more." Um, so that was a big piece. Um, you know, another one is the power of the personal touch. I mean, a lot has been said about Bill Clinton's charisma. Um, and he does have incredible charisma uh, face-to-face. I never met him before he became president. And, that, uh, of course, once you're president, it comes with a whole lot of uh, charisma just built in because you've got a lot of eyeballs on you, a lot of attention. Uh, you're world famous. Um, I met Barack Obama before he became president. And I can say he had a different kind of charisma than Bill Clinton did. But Bill Clinton could just light up a room. I mean, there was no questioning when he was in a room around other people. He, he it was just magnetic. And believe me, I've been around a lot of other world leaders. I've been around governors. I've been around senators. I've been around presidential candidates, people running for president. And I never saw someone who had that same kind of magnetism as Bill Clinton did. But it really it boiled down to he paying attention, really paying attention to people. Um, he. You know, every person in the room he wanted to pay attention to and he wanted to help if he could. He had – it's called body guys, these you know, generally young men who would go around with him, carry some briefcases, carry a bunch of business cards, collect books that people gave to him. And they did double time because he was constantly on a rope line talking to different people, saying he wanted to follow up with this person and that person and um, wanting to introduce them to services. And that was the real kind of retail politics that led – to his success from you know the backwoods of Arkansas to the governor's office in, in Arkansas all the way up to the White House because he really mastered that on a local level. You know, it's it's in the business world, it's about making one client or one customer happy. And if you can do that, then you can scale it up. But you don't scale before you can make one client or customer happy. And that's what Bill Clinton did. Is he he knew how to make one voter, one citizen, one resident, one constituent happy. And he did that by being of service to them, making sure that their you know roads were paved, making sure that a stop sign was there, making sure that their kids were educated. And he did that really well. And, and the reason the reason that he rose to the level that he did, in spite of his poor background, is because he really mastered that. And so I think that's a great lesson for all of us in business as well, is to apply that uh, as well. So that's a couple of things that I've learned from being there. Um, the charisma and magnetism piece. Uh, is that something you think can be learned uh, and developed in a person who doesn't necessarily have it naturally? And if so, how? I think I think you can, you know I wouldn't trouble yourself too much with the idea of if you feel like you're not that magnetic, you feel like you don't have that much charisma. I would just focus on that piece of seeing how you can be of, of service to people. Sometimes it's really just about people are a little too self involved. You know, I mean, I mean, um, just simply, and it, this is classic Dale Carnegie. If you just simply take interest in someone and just try and help them, even if it's in a subtle way, even if it's unrelated to your vocation, even if it's just like making a suggestion or recommendation or or after you've met someone, if they told you something that they need, it could be something small like, oh, I'm trying to plan my eight-year-old's birthday party and we haven't found a venue yet. You know, if afterwards you follow up, you live in the same town, you know, if afterwards you follow up and say, hey, I asked my sister-in-law – if she, that venue she used six months ago, if it's still available, she said it is, and you send an email to that person and with a link to the website, you go that extra step, you go that extra mile, it makes such a big impact on people. And screw charisma. You don't need to have the world's greatest charisma. I mean, I've met a lot of people who've got tremendous charisma, but they don't follow up. You know, there's no, there's no, you know, you meet them at some event mm-hmm. and they're charismatic and everything. But then you never hear from them again. And I'd much rather have a relationship with someone who follows up with me or goes the extra mile or, or sends me an email like that, is diligent and thoughtful. You know, that goes a lot further than some kind of, you know, ephemeral charisma that we're either born with or not born with. Hmm. You know, it's interesting. As I'm hearing you say that, uh, I can't help but think of a, a passage from Ryan Holiday's new book, which I happen to get early access to, about how ego is the enemy. And often we go into situations uh, almost unconsciously approaching every interaction as to what we can get from it as opposed to what we can give to it. Oh, that's that really resonates with me because I think, uh, I think that that's really the core 
of um, what leads someone to be successful or not is if you and there's a great Zig Ziglar quote. I'm going to butcher it, but it's yeah. something like you know you can get anything you want in this life if you just help everyone else get what they want. Uh-huh. Um, and there's tremendous truth to that. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm curious. So, you know, you mentioned some of the things that you learned about politics. Uh, I mean, you've kind of moved through all these different ecosystems. And I'm wondering what the patterns you've seen around success, around relationship buildings, and, and of course, you know, what things you've seen people do wrong. I mean, obviously, uh, Clinton didn't have a flawless presidency, right? Right. So I'm just curious, you know, what are the lessons that you've taken away from various situations, both negative and positive? Well, it's, it's interesting because I've worked for a president who was impeached and I've worked for a governor who was recalled because I went straight from the White House to working as a speechwriter for the governor of California, Gray Davis, who those of you who aren't from California is now known as the governor who preceded Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I went in that position, I went from rolling blackouts to recall over the course of three years. Um, so it was a, definitely an up and down. And what I saw, what I take away from both of those is that we're going to have failings. You know, Clinton was not a perfect man. He had personal failings. Um, and we're going to have setbacks. And when the SHIT hits the fan, the question is going to be, are, are the, are allies going to rally around us? Are they going to help me? Are they going to help us? Even if it's us, if it's a self-inflicted wound, if it's something that we screwed up. You know, maybe you try and have a live event and, you know, you don't, you fail to plan or it doesn't go off well. And so people are angry at you. You know, is that is that your fault? You screwed up. You know, you want, you know, are your friends, are your allies going to surround you? And what I saw in those two experiences was when when Bill Clinton, when the when he was going through impeachment and the trial in the Senate and everything, you know, some of his longest standing supporters they stood up and they said, you know what, he screwed up, but we don't think that this is an impeachable offense or we don't think he should be removed from office. And they stood by him. And I think that was a, a really credit to the years of, of effort that he put into building those relationships. Now, when I went through the recall situation, I didn't see that happen. You know, Gray Davis's friends, you can, you can, it, you can assign uh, whatever reason you want to it, but the, the allies didn't stand by him in the same way um, as they did Bill Clinton. And so it taught me really the importance of long-term friendships and relationships and the, the importance of keeping those relationships as, as close as possible because you never know when you may need them. It might be that your business needs a little bit of injection of a little bit of life, a little bit of help. It might be that you lose your job. You know, we we have these setbacks in life, and you need to rely on other people. And it, you know, kind of, it gets under my skin when I get an email from someone who I haven't heard from from two years for two years, and they send me an email. It's like, hey, John, how you doing? Haven't seen you. How you been? Um, yeah. So by the way, I just lost my job, and do you have any uh, leads? And it's like, you know, I feel sorry for you for losing your job, mm-hmm. but you know, here you are contacting me for the first time in two years. I mean, that is very self interested, you know, yeah. and. Part of the reason that someone like that struggles is because they haven't spent enough time and energy nurturing those relationships. Hmm. You know, it, it's interesting because I, I look at some of the more challenging periods and I, I realize what uh, a significant role unconditional support from a few close friends played oh, in, yeah. in the most difficult periods. And like, you, you couldn't have gotten through without it. You know, like Brian, my business partner, he and I, I were having this chat, chat and he said, you know, hope is the most valuable currency in the world. And he said, you know, when you give somebody else hope, even just by being that for them, he said, think about it. You'll feel eternally indebted to those people. And yet there's no way they can collect on that debt. You know, it's such a beautiful thing. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I think I email uh, my friends more when they, have a setback than when it, they have a victory because, um, and you've probably seen this through your life when you have like a big success, everyone emails you, yeah, yeah, yeah they'll want to be part of that, yeah. you know, and then you have some kind of major setback and it's like crickets, you know. Mm-hmm. But I've been through that, you know, I experienced my own dot com failure when my quote unquote stable government job working as a speechwriter and press aide in, in the governor's office. After, for a president, for a governor who just gotten reelected, was you know no more a, a year later, unprecedented happened, um, and during the recall campaign, and um, you know it, it it is incredibly valuable when someone reaches out to you, you remember that you know because a lot of times people 
you know, we go through these waves in our careers. I mean, I had a good friend who was an intern. When I was working in the White House, uh, um, there was a girl across the hall named Katie, good friend. We became good friends. Even though she was an intern, I was an employee. You know, we became friends. And um, we had ups and downs in our careers. Uh, we both worked in politics for years. And she ended up, you know, kind of being out of politics for a while and then get back in. And then 2008 presidential campaign, she decides to jump back in again, and she gets a job not working for a campaign, but working for the candidate's wife in 2008, helping as communications director. Well, she ended up working for Michelle Obama. Mm -hmm. And for four years, she went from, uh, you know, from like just being like really close with the Obamas, like got to know them really well. She wrote a Marine one. She wrote an Air Force one multiple times. She went to Camp David. She had an incredible ride. And I think the lesson I get from that is that we have ups and downs in our career. And for the people that we have relationships with, you need to treat them with respect no matter if they're in an upswing or a downswing because, you know, someone who you see get, losing a job now or their business failing now, a couple of years from now, they may be on, the, on a high or it might happen to you and, and you never know. So it's, you know, it's just it's best to keep those relationships strong. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I think that one of the things that became very apparent to me is, is the worst of times reveal uh, the truest of character in people. So true. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And so, yeah, I, I mean, you were asking, so the difference between what I've seen and um, through those experiences in, in the White House and the governor's office, um, you know, that was that was really one of the biggest takeaway for me. Um, and then for me personally, you know, when, when I lost my job in the recall, I was able to basically walk out of the job and get and get a new one almost immediately. Um, it, I didn't have the experience that my father did. It's a longer story, but, you know, when he lost his job three separate times, you know, journalism was a totally different industry, but it was harder for him to get another job for a variety of different reasons. But in, in my situation, you know, when I lost my job after the recall campaign, I was basically able to walk into a new job almost immediately. And it was because... I had kept all those other relationships, you know, uh, warm in case never, you never know. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. And, and so fortunately I was able to call in someone else. And I was able to walk into a new job, um, versus I had some colleagues who'd worked with me in the governor's office who were unemployed for six months or more as they were looking for work. So, um, I think it's not because I was smarter or because I was more talented or anything like that. I think it was just because, uh, you know, I'd, I'd held on to those other relationships, um, which came through in the end. Mm. You mentioned a dot com failure, uh, and I'm curious, you know, what it was about, what happened, uh, and you know how you navigated it uh, from an emotional perspective. Oh, yeah. oh no, I actually, so uh, I was referring to the recall campaign. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, I, 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 it's funny because it was 2003, mm -hmm. and it was in, I was living in Sacramento, Northern California, and I had all these friends from college who had worked in dot coms, and almost everyone I knew had had a dot com failure. And so I, I kind of refer as the California recall campaign as <laughs> my own personal dot com failure because it was like around the same era. And it was I went through the same experience as all my friends did as well. You know, I saw them all struggle, you know, and um, um, yeah, you, you know, so you, you never know. Even even being in like a stable government job, it could happen to you, too. Yeah. Um, well, let's just let's shift gears a little bit. And let's. Oh, talk. I didn't tell the Rob Lowe story. Oh, I'm happy to tell the Rob Lowe story. Yes, by all to, means. Yeah, yeah. We don't want to leave people hanging. No, yeah. I, I, I because you, you, you know, you, you made subtle reference to it, and I was like, okay, I guess that's all he's going to say. But yeah, absolutely, tell the Rob Lowe story. No, I'll tell it. So, um, so basically, I started working in in, in the White House. This was uh, 99, 1999, Okay, and um, 
so what happened was I started working there, and I'd come from Hollywood. I'd been working at DreamWorks and a couple other places, and I had a friend who still worked in Hollywood, and we were in touch, and she said that she had a friend who was working on a show that was about Washington, D.C., and politics in Washington, D.C., and would I talk to him and just talk about what my life was like you know, working in the White House? And I said, sure. And, you know, important point is I, I could have gotten in trouble for that. The press office usually <laughs> wants to handle it. And it's not like I shared any state secrets. You know, if the Secret Service is listening, it's not like I was giving away state secrets. I didn't have that high security clearance. And um, so, anyways, um, she puts me in touch. It ends up being Aaron Sorkin, who was working on the West Wing at the time. And he'd already done the American president. And so I knew exactly who he was, and I told him, you know, what my life was like. It wasn't all that exciting sometimes, uh-huh. but you know, they're crazy experiences. Like you could be walking into the bathroom and be stopped by the Secret Service because the president and the premier of China are like engaged in a heated discussion that no one sees because it's behind closed doors, you know, and you can't even make it to the restroom because they're blocking the way. Uh-huh. That kind of thing happened to me, and so I told him what my life was like. Told him what the experience was like, and. Um, you know, the funny thing was the West Wing hit, hit the air and it became an immediate success. And he had all kinds of high-level former White House people come in and work for him. So he didn't need my advice as much anymore. Um, and he had all these other people who were giving him advice. And so I, I kind of moved on. And the fall of 99, I wrote the White House Thanksgiving Proclamation, which is the reason that we celebrate Thanksgiving today is because the president issues this proclamation. It's kind of a formality now, but um, it goes all the way back to George Washington, Lincoln, everyone issued it, and they wrote it themselves. I mean, literally like, sat down and wrote it themselves, you know, with a quill, quill pen in the White House. Um, they didn't have big staffs back in those days. And so, 99, I wrote it, like, literally sat down and wrote it myself. You talk about the pressure that you have, you know, no, knowing that you're writing down this thing that's studied by historians. And so I wrote it. I was really proud of it. They printed it up on this big parchment paper, uh, kind of formal and everything. And I, I put a copy in the mail, and I sent it to Sorkin. Uh, I said, just FYI, here you go. I thought you might want to check this out. And I didn't think much of it. A year later, uh, November of 2000, I go and I, I put on the West Wing, and I watch the Thanksgiving episode. And the episode is about the writing of the Thanksgiving proclamation. And this this repeating theme throughout the entire episode is about like how the speechers are running around, you know, uh, talking about how they need to write the Thanksgiving proclamation. And the climactic scene, very end, Mar- uh, Martin Sheen, you know, playing President Bartlett, s- is about to walk out of the Oval Office and go into the Rose Garden to read this Thanksgiving proclamation. And he looks down, it's like, you know, the climax and everything. He looks down and he, sit, and he just reads the first line of the paper in front of him. And the line that he reads is the exact same <laughs> first line of the proclamation that I wrote. And, and then he goes off. And um, I just like, I was just like shocked, absolutely shocked, you know, like I couldn't believe it. And the reason I say that I, how I got Rob Lowe to play me on TV, well, the speechwriters that were running around that were writing the proclamation was played by Rob Lowe, of course, who was doing that. So um, that's kind of how I became partial inspiration, I guess you could say, for Rob Lowe's character. What did you learn about writing and communicating ideas uh, from the role that you had there? Because I'd imagine it'd have to be some stellar lessons in how to communicate. Yeah, wow. Um, Well... Uh, you know, there's no substitute for revisions <laughs> when you're right, right? I mean, you've written a bunch of books, you know. Yep. Just putting your butt in the seat and just writing, 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 and then rewriting and rewriting again and then getting feedback from other people. Um, I think that's incredibly important. Um, uh, you know, getting your ideas out there and, and letting your ideas be shaped. Involving other people is another big one. Um, you know, a lot of people like to write in um, just in a, a vacuum. Mm-hmm. Um, I think these days you've got so many different tools available to you with the internet and social media and everything that there's no reason not to involve other people. And whether it's just any kind of thought leadership, I think that you can get a lot from involving a community, getting feedback. And it doesn't mean that you like put your draft out and ask, you know, anyone to read it and, and give you feedback on the whole thing, but it could be something small like sharing, you know, if you, if you publish a book, sharing a book cover and asking people to vote on it um, or just talking to different people and getting feedback on a title or subtitle, something small like that. 
But when you do that, when you involve other people, you, your ideas become uh, more fully evolved. Um, and so I, I think that there's tremendous value from that. I mean, I know personally I'm, I'm a craftsman when it comes to writing, and I, and I take it personally, and I want it to be perfect, and I want to just you know work on my little thing. But whenever I've done that, whenever I go out and I have other people who I respect um, – take a look at my work and I get feedback from them, it'll, even if I don't change it, I'll, I'll be better off for it because I will have understood why I'm keeping it a certain way. Or maybe I'll modify it and make it, you know, maybe it's something that I didn't, I was too close to it. And so I didn't, I didn't realize that, uh, something is, is being read a certain way and not, not the way that I intended. Um, so there's some ideas. Well, Talk to me about the journey from the White House to Silicon Valley to where you're at today and how it's led you to doing the work that you're doing now. Oh, man. Well, kind of in a roundabout way. It wasn't like I intended to do this, and I think that's an important lesson. Um, I, I always liked writing, and I always liked um, sharing my writing, and I started blogging probably in about 2007, 2008, um, but it was always generic. It wasn't really focused, and... It wasn't until I, I really got feedback from other people. It was actually it was my friend Antonio, who I was in a mastermind group with at the time, um, who said, John, you know, you, the common thread among your, around your career is like you, you created these incredible opportunities here. You know, you, you worked at the White House, and you worked in the governor's office, Silicon Valley, whatever. Like, it, how did you make those things happen? Like, you know, and, and now even today, you do an incredible job of, of identifying people and then and then deciding you want to reach out to them and bu- building a relationship with them. Oftentimes they're influencers or VIPs. How do you do that? And it really wasn't until I got that feedback from him and some other people that I shifted and I zeroed in on this idea of, of how do you build better relationships and how do you use those relationships to grow your revenues. Mm-hmm. So um, I actually, had, initially, the blog that I have now, Smart Business Revolution, was kind of a generic entrepreneurship-focused blog, and it was just too broad. It wasn't focused enough, and it was getting that feedback that that led me to um, shift the focus and really zero on, on on this topic. and And it it made everything make sense. Everything up until this point had a had a connecting thread, and it was relationships. And it was only in hindsight that I could look back and realize that that was that was the through through point, the thing that that connected them all together. And it's fun. It's exciting because. Now, I, I do care a lot about this topic. I do like helping showing other people how, how they can grow their own business by building better relationships and, and exactly how they can do that, especially in a digital world today with all these kinds of tools like podcasting. Like A podcast is a tremendous tool for building relationships and growing your network, and I like talking about that. And it also, it also allows me to take stories from my past and use them to illustrate the stories that I share and and the message that I bring forward to the world. So I so I like all of that. Mm. So I, I think the question that probably is on a lot of people's mind is, okay, how do we build relationships in order to uh, increase revenue or grow our businesses? Sure, and there's a I mean there's a lot of different ways we can go with that. One of the big uh, problems is one is is that that keeps people back is really a mindset issue. It's it's the idea of you know how do I how do I have something to offer. Like Ashwini Rao, he's a wildly successful podcaster. He's got all these books out. You know, he's best friends with Glenn Beck. You know, like, <laughs> uh, uh, how, how could I possibly reach out to someone like that and, and connect with someone like that? And, you know, the truth is, well, there are many things that you could offer someone like Shrini. I mean, shoot, you could give them the wave report, you know, It'd be like, hey, you give them a new surf spot, you know? But people tend to get caught up on this idea. Like, I have nothing to, you know, to offer someone, you know, or they think that it needs to be related to their vocation. So they're a photographer, they're a web designers. So they think like, oh, maybe I can get Trinity to hire me to do a new website for him. Well, you know, way before that, you know, you can just provide some value to them and, and nurture that relationship. And then maybe it'll turn into some kind of business in the future. Maybe it won't, but maybe it will, you know, you never know. So I think mindset is really the most critical first piece, that initial step, because that that stops more people than anything else. A lot of people think like, oh, well, you know, I, I would connect with uh, Oprah Winfrey or Tony Robbins, but I just can't find their email address. Well, the truth is, you know, that's one small barrier. <laughs> it's really not, 
that's not the one critical factor. It's not as important as some of the other things, yeah. you know, such as being in the right frame of mind. So I always start with that initial initial point because I think a lot of us don't acknowledge how much of a barrier our own mindset can be. Well, you know, I'll, I'll share one story around that frame of mind. One of my, my long-term aspirations is to be an advisor to startups. And I realized, I was like, wow, nobody's going to come to me and just say, hey, you know, here's an equity piece. So I realized, I was like, okay, you know what? What if I went to people with wanting nothing in return and saying, hey, I, I, this is something I'm trying to do. And I'm wondering if you guys would let me be, you know, uh, would be willing to be my guinea pigs. And fortunately, that's how I've gotten to do some really cool work. Like I'm advising a, a group of uh, two designers who run a company called Good Fucking Design Advice, uh, two guys who run a podcast called Ideal Lemon. And recently, I found a guy who actually developed a podcasting app that I really happen to like. And I, I reached out to him and said, hey, I don't want anything. I'm just looking to build my portfolio as a startup advisor. And I think I can actually help you get more users to this app, especially because I have a podcast. Um, and I'm talking to him on Wednesday. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so that actually gets to the next piece that I think everyone needs to think about, which is being intentional about growing relationships with the right people. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of times what we do is our relationships are, and I'm not talking about friendships. Friendships are a totally different matter. But when I'm talking about business, business-related relationships are often a reflection of just circumstance. Like, you know, we're, we're, we have these relationships with people who work down the hall from us or who, you know, we used to work with or they're in, you know, in our industry rather than being really intentional about it. And one of the things that I advocate everyone to do is put together what I call your conversations list, which is a list of the 50 people who you'd like to build or deepen a relationship with over the course of the next 12 months. Hmm. And what that does is it gives you a roadmap. It gives you a list of people who you should really be focusing your energies on because you see them as being critical to your business moving forward, your career moving forward. And so often we don't do that. It doesn't need to take that much time. It could take 15 or 20 minutes to literally write out a list of these people. And it could be some people that you know already, or it could be other people that you don't know. Um, and what it'll do is it'll give you some guidance going forward. So like for you, Shrini, if like your goal is to advise more startups, that's great. You've got that clarity. Then you can look at your network right now, look at all the people that you know and be like, okay, well, who could help me to get to that end goal yeah. of advising more startups? You know, do I know some people who've you know started uh, companies in the past? Do I know any venture capitalists? You know, or can I use the tools available to me in order to build and nurture those relationships, like a podcast? Mm -hmm. That's a that's a wonderful tool because you can just like I, I say oftentimes that I would podcast if no one was listening to it because you can use that as an excuse to reach out to someone. So you could say like, all right, well, here's 50 venture capitalists. I think this would be really helpful to me. I'm going to identify them and I'm going to reach out for over the next 12 months. I'm going to reach out to these 50 different venture capitalists and I'm going to interview them on my show. And that's really just the excuse for the start of a relationship. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to build and nurture that relationship from there. So I think having some uh, roadmap in the form of your conversations list is a great place to start and a great way to give yourself some guidance going forward. Mm. So... What else? I mean, these, these are phenomenal ideas, by the way. And I know we're probably just uh, scratching the tip of the iceberg. Sure, yeah. So, um, well, let's talk a little bit about social media, mm -hmm. and we'll talk a little bit about face-to-face, -face because those two are, are both two critical components. You know, a lot of people think, you know, social media is end-all, be-all, which is true, but there's no real substitute for face-to-face, -face, though, I believe. But social media is a, is a great tool to, you know, build a, and nurture a relationship with someone who you don't live in the same town with, you don't see them frequently, um, there's a lot of people that you can kind of you can keep a relationship with through social media over time. But the critical step that so many people fail is a lot of times people, you know, they'll they'll be like, yeah, I go on Facebook 45 minutes and it doesn't it's like seems like a waste of time. Well, the reason is because they're doing it like a creepy stalker. They're just like going on to their Facebook feed for like 45 minutes and looking at everyone else's vacation vacation photos and they're not really engaging with it. Well, how can you take that further? You know, I mean, when was the last time you saw someone post on Facebook? that they needed something, and you didn't just, like, comment down below, oh, bummer, hope you can find one, you know? <laughs> what if you actually, like, sent an email to someone else to see if you could help that person, you know? Or if you could find some resource or find some tool or, or posted it on your own Twitter or posted it on your own LinkedIn, you know, or asked around or picked up the phone and called someone and said, hey, do you know, I, I, you know, someone I'm friends with on Facebook, they just posted they're really looking for a full-stack developer, do you know any full stack de developers that 
that you know or Ruby on Rails developer. You know, do you know anyone? You know, and then if you get that, you know, and then reaching back out to that person, sending them an email, not just messaging them on Facebook, it's sending them an email saying, "Here, here's here's someone that I heard of that might be a good fit for you." You know, just going that extra mile can make a, a heck of a difference. And you know, a lot of times when we are passive consumers of social media, we don't think about taking that extra step. And then the other thing I said was uh, face to face. You know, yeah. there's really no substitute for face to face. So especially in this, you know online connected world so often it, it, we can we can forget about the importance of meeting up face to face but i go a couple of times a year i fly out to different events i i went to atlanta for a weekend a couple of months ago i went to san diego for a night because i knew that people that i wanted to build relationships with were going to be there they're going to be there at a conference or whatever so i'm going to go and i'm going to prioritize that because i want to uh, be at those places where you can, you know, develop those relationships face to face because there's really no substitute for it. Once you've you've spent some time face to face, gotten to know people, each other as a, you know, just as a human, yeah. um, then that relationship is going to be so much stronger. Mm. Well, this has been awesome, John. Uh, so I have one last question for you, which is how we finish all our interviews with the unmistakable creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Uh I think that it, it is, um, it's not, you know, getting back to one thing we talked about earlier, it's not, um, it's not you're born with it or, you, or you're not charisma. It's, that's not it. Um, it's, actually, it's actually putting in the effort, putting in the work and being deliberate about it, being intentional about it. You know, the people that I know that are uh, phenomenally successful are ones that just, they put in the work. They they fight hard for it. They know there are going to be setbacks along the way, and they are okay with that. And they don't let their own negativity get in the way. They don't let the setbacks along the way cripple them. They are upset about it, and then they move on. Um, and you know, those are the people that I think are really successful. It's not about the setbacks that you're going to experience or the stumbling. It's about what you do about it, what you do after you get past that point. Um, so everyone I know who's been who's who's been successful, you know that I don't know a single person who hasn't experienced a lot of setbacks along the way. It's just about how they deal with it. Hmm. Well, uh, like I said, this has been phenomenal, and uh, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us and share your insights and your story with our listeners at the Unmistakable Creative. Oh, thank you, sir. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. If you like what you heard, the greatest compliment you could give us is to share the show with a friend and let people know what you think by leaving a review on iTunes. Thanks for listening to The Unmistakable Creative.